here at Grace Lutheran in Ely, Minnesota. I'm Pastor Eric, and we're so grateful that you are joining us for worship today. Uh, no matter where you are joining us, uh, we hope that you are doing well uh, and uh, have taken some time uh, here this morning or whenever you're viewing this video uh, to, uh, to worship and to give thanks to God for all that God is doing. A uh, few things uh, before we uh, begin worship. First of all, remember this is the third Sunday of Easter, uh, a season of the church year that lasts for 50 days, uh, concluding with uh, the celebration at Pentecost. Uh, so remember, Easter is not just one day, but it is an entire season, uh, as our uh, Facebook page uh, reminds us. Uh, after worship, I uh, certainly invite you uh, to call a friend. Uh, don't text them, don't send them a, uh, an email or a message on Facebook. Uh, I invite you to call them. Call a friend, call two, call three or ten. Uh, see how they're doing. Uh, let them know how you're doing. It, it's good for us to, to take care of one another, uh, both uh, for you to take care of someone and for someone to take care of you uh, at this time when we can't gather uh, in person. Uh, speaking of uh, gathering in person, remember uh, that we are staying very vigilant uh, as a church, as a council, uh, to make sure that um, we don't uh, gather too soon. Uh, so, in and in trying to uh, stay um, vigilant about what they, uh, what our governor uh, Governor Walls is telling us, uh, and with that, uh, you should know that we will not be gathering in person at least. Uh, through the beginning of June. Uh, we are doing our best to uh, follow what the schools are doing. Uh, so through the beginning of June, we believe uh, the first Sunday of June, June 7th, uh, we will not be gathering in worship, so we will continue to be gathering uh, in this way um, over Facebook and uh, gathering digitally uh, for the time being, at least for the next month or so. We will keep you updated about that. Uh, also, uh, remember that um, as you um, have planned offerings for the year, remember that there are many ways for you to, to make an offering. Uh, you can um, do so by going to our website, graceinhealy.org, uh, and there should be some information there about ways that you can give uh, to the church. Uh, we do receive those emails when that takes place. But you can also... Um, give through the mail. Uh, our mailing address is 301 East Conan Street, uh, Ely, Minnesota. Um, 55731 is our zip code. Our mailing, that's our mailing address. You can also um, send us an email, uh, Grace Lutheran, Ely, MN at gmail.com, and we can help get you set up uh, through simply giving uh, our recurring month-to-month -month, uh, giving program. Uh, so you can send us any questions either through that, uh, through the email, or through our uh, site on Facebook. Uh, one more announcement before we begin is that next week, um, instead of having me uh, lead worship, uh, resources have been made available through our bishop, uh, Bishop Tom Aiken of Northeast Minnesota Synod. Uh, he has put together some, uh, some worship resources for us. Uh, so that uh, all the pastors in our synod uh, are able to take some time to take care for themselves. Uh, so we will be providing some links uh, to that uh, later in the week uh, through our synod website, uh, where he and another pastor in our synod, uh, as well as some of their musicians, have worked together for uh, a worship service through liturgy and through sermon. Um, all of those links will be posted through our website, as well as uh, Facebook and in email form so that you can uh, worship uh, as you please, but we will also do our best to post them at our usual 9.30 Sunday morning um, so you can uh, use those resources uh, as you're able. I hope you have taken some uh, opportunity to gather some water because as you see, we'll, we will be doing uh, a Thanksgiving for baptism here momentarily. So as we gather for worship, whoever we may be, we gather as we live, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And seeing that it is Easter season, Alleluia! Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Join together with Christ. 
Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us therefore give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delights. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river Jordan your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and the word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, your Son makes himself known to us, his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes to us from Luke chapter 24, the familiar road to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place these days? He said to them, What things? And the disciples replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a mighty prophet, Indeed, and a word before God and all the, all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself and in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But the disciples urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. Because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and, has, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what, he had, what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I think about what we hold sacred as a community or as family units, there are two incredibly important things that come to mind. Stories and meals. Stories help remind us of where we have been, of where we are, and of where we are going. Stories guide us in our decision making because the past helps us to be informed about the present and about the future. In the many organizations of which we are a part, the stories of these organizations give us fond memories, a sense of togetherness, perhaps a ritual that might be part of meetings, and they, the stories help new people to the organization understand its purpose and mission of that group. At the same time, meals bring people together around the table. Food and meals can be a unifying force. Think about it. The various events that we have meals together, birthdays, funerals, parties, weddings, holidays, gatherings, anniversaries, and our day-to-day -day meals that often bring families and friends together, whether in person or now, perhaps virtually. Meals provide us our dietary nourishment as well as our social nourishment, as we often use meals to check in with those very same family and friends. When we think about stories and meals in Scripture, we often see that the stories of the past inform the identity of those recalling them, and oftentimes we hear even God recalling those stories as a way of calling new people into the ministry to which God has called them. When we hear about things like the calling of the story of Moses in Exodus, God reminds Moses of that very same identity, that God is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, thus recalling God's faithfulness to God's people and the way that God acts. God's people do the same thing. We recall God's faithfulness to God's promises through things like worship, Bible studies, and Sunday school. During meals in Scripture, those meals often recall events in the past to those partaking that are reminded of the past, present, and future promises that God makes. In the Last Supper, Jesus gathers with his disciples for the Passover meal. Thus, Jesus and his disciples are recalling God's promises to the Israelites that were living in Egypt, that they will be spared and that they will be freed from slavery. Today, in our scripture passage from Luke, we see stories in a meal do what they have always done, recall God's promises from the past and into the present and looking towards the future. They also do the work of revealing Jesus' identity to those whom he encounters on the road to Emmaus and to others after his resurrection. As we begin this familiar resurrection story, it is important to remember that where we are at in Luke's Gospel. This story begins on the very same day that the women at the tomb were greeted by two angels and by that very same empty tomb. The women rushed to tell the disciples, and all things seemed to them to be an idle tale. Peter even got up and ran to the tomb, seeing for himself the linens, that the tomb was empty, and he went home amazed. On the road to Emmaus, the same day as the reported resurrection, two of those disciples, Cleopas and an unnamed disciple, 
begin their journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. As they are journeying this seven-mile trip, they are discussing the things that have happened over the past few days. And as they do so, Jesus comes and begins the journey with them, though they do not recognize that it is him. Jesus asks the men what they are discussing. The two men are absolutely astounded at this question from Jesus. This would be the equivalent of someone coming up to us and asking one of us what has been in the news the last few months. We certainly would be astounded ourselves and would have to tell this person of what has swept the globe over these past few months. These two disciples then share all that has happened over the past few days. They essentially have a conversation with Jesus about the news. The disciples share the expectations they had about Jesus of Nazareth being the one who was to come as a mighty prophet in word and deed before God. They share the reaction of the chief priests who handed Jesus over to be condemned to death and to be crucified. They shared the way their hopes were dashed as they believed this Jesus was to be the one who would come to redeem the world. Even more so, they were astounded at the news from the women of the tomb, where he had been laid and saw that the tomb was empty, and had been told by angels that Jesus was alive, but did not see him there. All sorts of emotions likely accompany this story. Grief, hope, sorrow, and the hidden expectation of joy. How does Jesus respond to this? These expectations that remain unmet and to being told about the events of the past few days. He does a walking Bible study with these two. He begins with those familiar stories, those sacred stories, with Moses, and works his way through the prophets, and interprets for them all of the signs for what and who the Messiah is, and thus, what and who he is. All of this done according to the scriptures. He lays it all out there to them in an attempt to help them understand. Yet, through all of this Bible study and interpretation, Jesus' identity remains hidden in plain sight to them. As they near their destination, and as Jesus finishes this Bible study, Jesus seemingly continues to go on his journey, going past the maze. Yet, the, these two disciples ask Jesus to come and stay with them, offering hospitality place to sleep and meal in his, and, a, and some warm food to eat. It is there that the full revelation of Jesus' identity occurs as they have their meal together. Jesus does those familiar actions that we hear so frequently. Jesus takes the bread, breaks it, broke it, and gave it to them. As they receive this bread, they recognize who was truly with them, but Jesus had already vanished. The meal they had with Jesus recounted the many times throughout Scripture of the promised presence of God. They had recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread, and after the fact realized it was Jesus as he did that walking Bible study with them, recounting the sacred stories of their faith. For these two disciples, who had been in grief, in sorrow, in mourning, and had heard about the hope that their Messiah had been raised from the women at the tomb, they continued to navigate a new reality for them, a new reality they did not anticipate. They then come across a man who has opened the scriptures to them, and a man with whom they ate. In those two familiar settings, hearing the sacred stories of their faith,
and having a meal, Jesus was revealed to them. We ourselves are living in a reality we did not anticipate. Someone navigating this new reality each day. A new reality of new life, of resurrection, of joy, of triumph, of love, hope, belonging, and yet the painful reminders of hopelessness, death, struggle, and lament remain present for us. We are living in both of these worlds simultaneously. We often take time to acknowledge that Jesus is present through our sacred stories, through scripture, worship, at church, in nature, in each other, in acts of love, and in meals, at home, and at the altar. How are you taking time to recognize that Jesus is at work? Where is Jesus walking alongside you? My encouragement to you today, and in the days ahead, is to take some time to reflect on this. Where do you see Jesus journeying with you, with all of us? Look for the stories of hope through those who are bringing hope, those who are helpers, those in the medical profession, and those serving our communities to keep us safe, to provide for our needs. Look also at yourself. You are a people of hope. You are a people of love. You are keeping yourself and others safe. You are serving and loving God and serving and loving your neighbor by staying home, by wearing a mask, by washing your hands. Remember, Jesus walks with you on our journey that seemingly is not going to end anytime soon. Jesus walks with us now and always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join now in a prayer which our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As you go on your way from here, receive God's blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for worship here this morning. Don't forget to give a call to two, three, or ten friends, family members. See how they're doing. Offer to them how you are doing. Remember to pray for each other. And remember that as we continue in our social distancing, our masks, and the washing of hands, and so many other things, remember that we are doing this out of great love for our neighbors keeping them safe, keeping them from harm, keeping ourselves from harm. You are doing God's work in this time, and know that it is appreciated and that it is enough for this day and for tomorrow and in the days ahead. Remember, on this continued journey, Jesus walks with us. Let us take time in the days ahead to stop, to listen, to hear Jesus open those sacred stories, to hear the meal, to be with him as he shares a meal with us, wherever we may be until we can gather again around the altar and share in a meal together with his body and blood, in bread and in wine. God
God's blessings to you as you journey this week. Thanks be to God.